Yo, what up, what up, what up, what up? We got a lovely movie here. Getting into some action on this one. This one got Godfrey Cambridge, Raymond St. John, Calvin Lockhart, Red Fox, and some others. Y'all want to know what this movie is? Talk about it when we get back. The Groove Pavement. Podcast, talk show, and movie review. The Groove Pavement. Can you dig it, sweet mama? <laughs> dig it. Oh, what's up, y'all? I am Sean Strong. And I am Dakaris McLaren. And this is The Groove Pavement. And this movie we're talking about now, great action flick, Cotton Comes to Harlem. We're we'll going to be talking about it. This is 1970. 1970. Yeah, yeah. 1970. All right, so before we get into it, we'll make sure y'all like our Facebook page, like follow us on Instagram, subscribe to our YouTube page, and check us out on Vimeo. And don't forget to subscribe to our website. Hit that notification button so when we get these next episodes, y'all already riding with us. All right, so Cotton Comes to Harlem. Dope yeah. flick. Action pack. Based Pack-a-pack. on Cotton Comes to Harlem. And this is a bit of a reunion here. Yes, it is. Uh, Chester, ha- Chester Himes, who is a uh, very accomplished novelist. Mm-hmm. Um, he's, he's reunited with an actor who is a very underrated actor. Named Raymond St. John. Dope actor. And if you remember, Chester Himes is also the writer of If He Hollers, Let Him Go, which is another movie that was adapted from that novel starring Raymond St. John. So it's a bit of a reunion here. Yeah, And there's no coincidence that they're talking about race because it's injected in there because all the things that was happening around those times. But this movie, directed by the great Ossie Davis. Ossie Davis. Uh, it's pretty dope. And it, it's it's a pretty much a detective flick, but has some comedy in it and it's action. You know, yeah. if you want to, if, if if anybody's familiar with Donald Goins, hmm. I think Chester Himes is pre Donald Goins, yeah. Uh, yeah. but it's in that same vein. Uh, Cotton Comes to Harlem, the novel, is a lot darker, mm-hmm. but um, and it takes a very serious tone where um, Ozzy, he puts a comedic spin. Mm-hmm on uh cotton comes to harlem the cinematic version yeah and this is actually a part of a, a franchise or a set you know let's call it a franchise um because after that is uh, come back charleston blue which we're going to talk about next week which is also based on a chester himes novel called the heat's on so he pretty much was the the black um oh man eric jerome dickey no no um <laughs> who did it uh, Stephen King. Stephen King, yeah, man, he pretty much like Stephen. A lot of mo- a lot of uh, directors are t- are making movies off of Stephen King. So, uh, this this Hines these these these, mo- these novels turn into flicks is actually, even though they're not so much like the book, uh, but that's kind of like always the case. But yeah. it does, you know, have the flavor of the director. Cinematically, they do take liberties with mm-hmm. you know with the book, but I would say. That uh, out of the Chester Himes books that have been turned into movies, mm. Cotton Comes to Harlem is is actually the truest to mm. the the novel. And you know when we go through the scenes, I'll point out some differences. Yeah, yeah. And this was actually filmed in Harlem. Uh, that's one of the things I like about these films is you know in the seventies that they actually shoot on location. Yeah. And you see the activities and the experience of the, uh, the black culture then and there, the young kids, the, the, the broken homes and stuff like that. And you get a feel of it as you know what was going on at those times. So the filming of it, and they also have a nice chasing, yeah. which, which is pretty dynamic. I can't say it was hard to do, but I guess it was hard to do because then you got the whole security thing of something might happen and, and, and liability, but... It's definitely a dope scene. And also, I, I feel that Ossie Davis, his directing, and fathered folks like Spike Lee and, yeah. and others in, in their style and certain sceneries that you, you, you capture in here. Uh, but yeah, this this is... Last week and previous, we talked about uh, Godfrey Cambridge and Watermelon Man. Melvin Van Peebles. Yeah. So now... We're coming back up in a different style, which is pretty dope, as Grave Digger Jones and Coffee Ed Johnson. Yep. So let's get into it a little bit. And also, you know, we have to also, you know, Calvin Lockhart 
is playing Reverend Deco Malley. Deco Malley. <laughs> yeah, the smooth brother. Um, this movie is actually pretty dope. You know, it, it it's pretty much Deco Malley. Uh, they think he's a con man. He's one of these guys who's gonna get people to go back to Africa or go, you know. This type of thing. So he's he's part, you know, he's Reverend Deco Malley. Reverend Deco Malley. So he's part Father Divine, <laughs> uh, part Marcus Garvey, and he's a whole con man. Yeah, oh, well, um, and also, it reminds me of well, um, Sweet Daddy Rich. Yeah. If you ever watch Car Wash, Richard Pryor plays Sweet Daddy Rich, so how he yeah. got his little peoples around him. So. Yeah, Fa- Father Divine, for those that don't know. Mm. Uh, Father Divine was always well dressed. Mm-hmm. He um, in his sermons he had uh, you know black uh, economic independence, you know, you know racial equality. Mm-hmm. Um, and then if you know anything about Marcus Garvey, coming up in the early 1900s, um, right, he is he is taking on that type of uh, that type of um, character, mm-hmm. and this is how he's able to draw people in. Deco Malley. Yeah. And they even stated he said you couldn't could even been the next Malcolm. Mm-hmm. Or something like that. Um but yeah, let's check out this first scene and this kinda like pushes uh the movie forward, but you also gotta just think about the title. You know, Cotton Comes to Harlem. Why would he be talking about? Oh, Malley? Yeah. We're from the go. DA's office. He wants to see you. DA's office? Why well, I'm busy. Now let's go. Wait a minute, buddy. Let's see your credentials. Quit stalling, O'Malley. Black Judith! That's what you are! That's what they do to me! Now, now, I'm going downtown right now and tell that white man's district attorney that Dick O'Malley's getting sick and tired of being pushed around. All right, keep it black till I get back. Okay, let's go. O'Malley, he had his little uh, pitch talk, getting the people to sign up, giving their money, and uh, it looks like there's gonna be a switcher rule, but there's actually some some gunshots, and it ain't OJ in this this particular movie, yeah. but somebody bust shots, to yeah. break it up. So so far, uh, Deke O'Malley has collected eighty seven thousand dollars from the people. From the people. You know, now here's somebody that, like I said, he is he is preaching self-dependent, self, you know, uh, self-determination, I should say. Mm-hmm. And um, he's he's got this pro-black feel and plus he's he's Christian at the same time. Mm-hmm. So he's drawing he's able to draw that influence um, and he's selling shares at one hundred dollars a pop to his black star line. Well, not black star line, black beauty, yeah. uh, black star line was Marcus Garvey's uh, ship that was going to sail people back to Africa. Mm-hmm. The only problem is is that his is a whole fraud. Marcus had the real thing. Mm-hmm. And so uh, Marcus was selling shares in the Black Star Line uh, for $5. He's selling it at this time for $100. Mm. So after that, you know, it looks like they about to get robbed. So it kind of looks like, you know, did... Deco Malley set this up to take the money that has already been given up by the peoples. And this starts the whole car chase thing. And it and uh, Godfrey and Raymond St. John, they play Gravedigger Jones and Coffee, Coffin Ed Johnson. They uh-huh. got to try to figure out. Uh, and they were actually there. So now they are in pursuit to get Deco Malley and find out what's happened. And then. You know, Deco Malley, he's that dude, he's that sly dude. He got he's he's pimp like in a sense. And he got these beautiful women. This one this beautiful women that he got uh with her. Judy Pace plays the character of Iris, which That's is his main dude. chick. Yeah. So beautiful. Grave digger and coffin We're gonna go check her out. We're gonna talk to her her and you know, they trying to find Deco Malley because you know it, he may have this uh, eighty-seven thousand, but then the other thing that happens too is this uh, throughout this uh, car chase, in one of the trucks, a bale of cotton comes out. Yes, 
in Atlanta, and, and this is Harlem. So, you know, remember that there's this, you know, if you haven't seen this movie, you know, there's a bell of cotton and these detectives will find out why is there cotton in Harlem. Uh, but let's check the scene out with some beauty and some contrast and some talk. I think, you know, there's a book that you want to talk about that. Yeah. Um, picture. so in this scene, uh, Iris, uh, which is Deke O'Malley's, uh, girlfriend, um, you know, uh, Gravedigger Jones and uh, Coffin Ed Johnson, they go to her apartment to question her mm. about Deke O'Malley's whereabouts because he has since disappeared since all this has happened. And um, and I, I'm going to talk about there's some contrast uh, between the novel mm. and what actually appears on screen, even to how uh, this young lady is, is, is casted. Then Now, that's the lovely Judy uh, Pace, mm. who looks like a chocolate... Barbie doll. She really does. <laughs> really does, yep. O'Malley ran it on the mafia, remember? Could have been them. Them boys don't never forget. Could be his numbers up. Unless Digger and me get to him first. Where is he? Well, how about it? Hiding out, he ain't got a chance, Iris. Deke O'Malley always has a chance. Hello, Betty. Yeah, give me that. Phone. All right, O'Malley. Do you just have a favor and come in? Oh, shit. Oh, shit. God damn it, Ed. Cool it. He's crazy. Mm. He's crazy. That son of a bitch is crazy and I want him out. I got him, Iris. Two days, two weeks, two months. Mm. It's all the same. I'm nailing his ass to the wall. Be smart, Iris. Get off the boat before we sink him. And, and I want to remind you again, um, I think also, you know, even in, on TV, a lot of TV shows, you know, you got the Perry Masons and stuff like that. Uh, I guess we threw ourselves in there or, or they wrote for us these detective flicks. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, because after this, we see Shaft. Uh, but I also want to mention, too, it's like when you watch this movie, you see, you know, there's some humor in it. And then, you know, what's going on in society. Uh, they have some race in there as well. Some of the, you know, the racial tension. Um, but, it, yeah, it, it just works in a sense that it takes us takes us a little bit away from our actual reality. Uh, but the detective things was a big thing. And for us to add this comedy and, and the contrast between these two. Raymond St. John being a, you know, up and coming star at the time. Uh, this actually movie, this movie works. You know. And so I, I want to know if people were paying attention to the scene because mm -hmm. there's some, there's some, if you are a Chester Himes fan, there, there's a, there's a nod to the novel. Mm -hmm. And um, one, uh, I, I, I would love to have had the opportunity to talk to Ossie Davis about mm -hmm his choice in actress because Iris, which is uh, Deke O'Malley's girlfriend, mm -hmm. is actually mixed race. So she's a very in, fair in, skin in the novel. In the novel. Okay. And um and when they and when Gravedigger and Coffin come to the apartment, what they what what's in her apartment uh, at uh, that's that's very noticeable is the book Sex and Race. Hmm. Cuz she's a product of that book. And if anybody's familiar with sex and race, uh, it's a guy named Joel A. Rogers, which is a very prolific, uh, historian, mm. uh, Jamaican born, uh, prolific historian. Um, and he details the mixing between black and white. So he, he throws it out there in a very serious manner. Mm -hmm. And if you see, um, coffin picks the book up and very yeah. leisurely reads it, that's a nod to, the novel. So I wonder if people caught that. Mm -hmm. And the other part is, is that Coffin Ed Johnson is very quick tempered. Yeah. And mm -hmm. he's very, um, one of the things that you might not catch is like, so she threw a drink in his face, which mm -hmm. is, which is uh, insulting. It might make you mad, but he was ready to kill her for that. Yeah, he, he and the reason her for it. And the reason being for him wanting to react that way <laughs> is because in the book, the backstory is that Coffin has had acid thrown in his face. Mm. 
And that's why he's so violent. That's why he was so triggered by that. Again, read the book. Yeah. Yeah. I just thought about it. Yeah, he he grabbed her by her forehead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah if you, dudes, don't start doing that, man. You get mad at your girl, don't grab her by her forehead. Yeah, you know mad you have to be. <laughs> yeah, to grab somebody by her forehead <laughs> and throw them down. All right. So, and these two detectives, man, they 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 do their thing and they know Harlem, but still, you know, the higher ups, you know, I guess they still look at them in a certain way. Um. But that plays in part into, I guess, the reality. Uh, we're going to play and listen to the wordage. But at the same time, you know, they talk freely. They let it be known how they feel as well. Uh, talking about Grave Digger Jones. Mm -hmm. And he says it so so smoothly and, uh, and well, slick. Well, was with him. He talked and they threatened to get him. Why'd they wait? White guns coming up here, trying to knock off Reverend O'Malley, you think? Could be. Blacks find out about this or be held to pay. Anderson, I want round-the-clock police protection for Reverend O'Malley. To hell with O'Malley! What about the $87,000 of poor black folks' money that he stole from all over this country? Stole? That's right, stole. Now, we ran a check on O'Malley's entire operation. It's clean. Absolutely legitimate. Full clearance from the State Department, Securities Exchange Commission, the Attorney General of the State of New York. What else do you want? What the hell does the Attorney General, the State Department, or even the President of the United States know about one goddamn thing that's going on up here in Harlem? Ed O'Malley's respected Respect by responsible my ass. people, pastors, race leaders, politicians, not to mention the large following he has among black folk everywhere. Black folk need hope like everybody else. Now, what is it with you people? One of you, like Reverend O'Malley, tries to do something. Does anybody try to help him? Hell no, you're after him like crabs in a basket. Uh, how many shares of the Back to Africa Incorporated would you buy, Captain? That's impertinence. The hell it is. One more word out of you, I'm going to win you right off the lot. We've been trying to teach white folks all our lives. School's over. Let's go look for low boy at Junkie's Paradise. So you, you have so it's a very interesting conversation that they had, mm -hmm. and um, whenever whenever the establishment uh, okay's the leaders when they approve of the leaders, uh, those who are on bottom casted should really be suspect. Huh. When they approve, huh. we should be like, well, wait a minute, why do you guys like him so much? Mm -hmm. Again, Marcus Garvey was the subject of J. Edgar Hoover's uh, ire. From the time that he rose to prominence, Isabel. they weren't they weren't really uh, happy about Marcus Garvey's uh, activities and, 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 and basically how they were able to get Marcus Garvey mm. was on mail fraud based on false advertisement <laughs> for one of the ships. He had actually bought four ships, mm. but the ship that he showed in one of the brochures he didn't own yet. So they called that mail fraud and they were able to take him down based on that. But here it is. These guys are vouching for Deco Malley. Mm. And he, like I said, he's a whole con man. He's been grifting. He hasn't been he hasn't been advocating for his people. Right. He's been grifting and bilking money from him. Damn it, Anderson, who's in charge of this investigation? You or them? You've got to understand it, Digger, sir. I understand those two, all right. Too quick with their fists. Too flip with their talk, too fast with their guns, are two damn black maniacs on a powder keg. You're letting them run wild. Ed and Digger, they have their own special way of dealing with things up here. And if they find something kinky in Reverend O'Malley, I've got to respect it. I wonder if uh, Dr. Umar watched the movie. What do you think? <laughs> well, that could be a different conversation. Uh, we're going to go to another scene and also... I don't want to smoke with Dr. Umar. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yep. The Prince of Pan Africanism. I don't want any, you know, mm. I don't want any smoke with that. So, uh, the other thing that we stated about the actors and how they, uh, uh, a lot of them started up together. Yes. And this is their, their, you know, their training. I don't want to say their training, but, um, the, the, their genesis and, and coming into the acting world and these roles that they're playing. And cause we see them later on. And we see them later on in TV shows, their staples or whatever, maybe, or other movies that are staples later on in their career. But this is their beginning as uh, one of the key figures that we ain't going to see a lot in a, in a movie, but he makes his mark in the end. 
And there's that bell of yes. Here That's we have. Sister. And what kind of trick are you trying to play on me, your old Uncle Tom? Ain't no trick, ma'am. I'm just trying to get this bale of cotton onto my cart. Cotton? Yes, ma'am. And I was just wondering if some good, nice-looking, strong Christian lady like you wouldn't give me a hand. I am a Christian. That's why I don't take a stick and knock your teeth out. All of you. Trying to steal my money. Trying to steal your money? Yes, trickers. That's what you are. Every one of you. Are you old fool? Don't you think I got sense enough to know there ain't no such thing as a bale of cotton in Harlem? Hmm. Uncle Bud, played by Fred Sanford, and you're going to see them two later on. Played by Fred Sanford, played by Red Fox. You're going to see them two later on in Sanford. Yeah, you know. Helen Martin is her name. Yeah, and, and, you know, that cotton, uh, the cotton bell is there. So, and you see that he has it, and and that's one of the things. If you ever you've seen the movie uh, Den of Thieves, uh. Uh, I think they took some pointers from this movie because uh, Bud, Uncle Bud, aka Fred Sanford, actually has the same type of ploy. Uh, so we're gonna move on. You know, Deco Malley, he's a uh, He's love. He he has the gift of gab. He yeah. talks real slick. Got the nice look. So, see here's a here's where I talk about the novel again mm. because he needs somewhere to hide out. Yeah, that you know because he's kind of like on the run from that first shootout that happened in Act One in the beginning, which sets off everything sets off everything to figure out what happened to Deco Malley in that eighty seven thousand that was taken by the people. Yeah. So where so, is he hiding? So he finds himself hiding out in his right hand man's widow's now uh, is now his widow because yeah. uh, John was killed at the rally. Right, right. And um, now he is hiding out in uh, her her place. Mm -hmm. And so um, oftentimes with men of power, particularly uh, reverence, <laughs> you know, they have their share of women that are attracted to them. Mm -hmm. Even though her husband is not even cold in the ground. He's not even in the ground. But mm. look at how she treats him. Mm. Uh, in the novel, Iris Iris uh, walks in on them. Is something wrong, Reverend? A bale of cotton. Well, I'll be there. And this ain't no threesome that happens either. <laughs> we have got to find out what's happening, Sister Mabel. And surely Brother John would want you to help me. Oh, John. John, oh, you look so much like him in that robe. Oh, just to hear his name like that, oh, I miss him. Yes, and I miss him too, but listen, Sister Oh, Mabel. I need my John. I need him too, Sister Mabel, oh, but... who's going to take care of me now that John's gone? Who's going to love me? Who's going to need me? Who's going to be good to me now that John ain't here no more? Sister Mabel, I am here, and I am going to stay here. And I'm going to take care of you, and I'm going to love you, oh, but Reverend first... Oh, Mally, you were so... Sister wonderful. Mabel? Sister Mabel? Hey, Mabel. Oh, that's what you know. Honey. Oh, shoot. Oh. She walked in. Iris. Oh. Get me out of the way and shag it up with that chippy whore. Wait, wait a minute. Just one minute. You've got to understand. The Reverend... Iris, I called wait. you first. Ah. Yeah. Look, I had to Please find listen to me. To yeah, but she just... Vince's blows! Oh, oh, Will you two quit? The Reverend and I were trying to get back our people's money. I bet you don't call him that in the bed. Mm. Why, you? Quit it! Damn you! you. Stop it! No. Stop it, I said! Damn this! Let go! Let go of me! Let go of me! She can't call me that, can you? Oh, my God. She hit it in the head first. Oh. Plot number two right there, folks. Iris doing, uh, he, she fixed the headscarf a little bit. <laughs> she, uh, gave her some ships to think about. And, uh, that's another point where that kind of looks like it's going to put Deco Malley in a jam. Mm -hmm. He actually leaves the spot, but, you know, the, the other detectives, the higher ups, they thought Deco Malley was a good guy. Yeah, you know, 
And this, and this kind of alludes to he's not all of what he's cracked up to be. And uh, again, the novel is much darker mm. because the fight does take place. And he, uh, Deke, has been at uh, Mabel's apartment for uh, several days. Mm. And he's tried to resist her. But, you know, he winds up having sex with her over and over again. <laughs> so he's he's actually caught by Iris, you know, uh, kind of in the act. And uh, mm-hmm. Iris and Mabel get it on in the book. But, uh, but, naked. but yeah, Iris winds up, because Mabel is strong, Mabel, uh, Mabel is not losing this fight. Mm-hmm. And uh, Iris couldn't do anything with Mabel. But what she was able to do was get Deke O'Malley's gun. And she mm-hmm. empties the gun in Iris. And then Deke beats her up and leaves Mabel dead, Iris unconscious, and he flees the scene. Huh. So like I said, the, the novel yeah. is much darker. Yeah. But, but being that this was a, you know, kind of a comedy. comedy, they had to lighten it up. They switched it up. Uh, but yeah, it, it kind of works for the plots in this movie. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, Deke O'Malley, you know, he was out. It was like, yo, let me see what your fire escape is like. <laughs> Yeah, let me test it out. So that kind of puts him in a jam because later on, uh, one Iris is upset with him. Yeah, because now she's a, she's a, a a bottom chick scoring now. Mm-hmm. So she's gonna throw him, try to throw him under the bus, but she got her hands dirty, and cops knew it. Yeah. He he actually waited. So yeah, and then. We're also going to see another point, too. Like, you know, like we said, when this is a set or a franchise, we're going to see them later on on another, I guess, another case. Mm. Uh, so here, they're going to be introduced to a, I guess, it's a, this guy's from the mafia. Yeah, he's a mob boss. Uh, another thing I was mentioned, too, like a Mago. lot of these movies in, in Harlem was pretty much uh, the drugs that happened in Harlem was kind of brought in especially like dope was brought in by mafia they had their their foot in harlem for a long time and it also shows it in uh godfather of harlem yeah yeah uh, with uh forrest whitaker and also um you know you heard conversations of like uh like in the first godfather mm-hmm. when the five families are talking about how they're going to de- you know div- you know delve up the uh the work the yeah. divvy up the work um, you know, the enterprise, they said, you know, let the, you know, what, mm, you know, the let them have the drugs. Yeah. You know. So, yeah. So, uh, once they, to- uh, I forget this guy's name. Uh, Mago. Mago. Yeah. He, you know, to him, this 87,000 is small change to him. So, you know, Gravedigger and Coffin is trying to figure out who the players are and who had could have had part in it. So they go check him out. In this conversation, we're going to see that he prayed had nothing to do with it because that's beneath him. Yeah. Oh, sit right down next to the throne of grace. Hey. Sure, ain't you boys the man? Oh, someday, maybe. When Casper gets bald enough to run you out of Harlem. But right now, you're the man. Piano, piano. How's about a little lumsum fool choke boy all around? Hmm? Little T. They think we hit O'Malley. Knock off a colored rally and start a race riot, maybe? Are you crazy? You had it in for O'Malley. Deke? Nonsense. I like the boy, always have. He's a credit to the community. They're just trying to find O'Malley. So they just going to all the, the players. He went to Mag- Mago, Magazine, Mago, yeah. Mago, whatever. And uh, it's not really him, so he can figure out other things. And there's a lot of stuff in there, which which is pretty dope with Asi. I guess it has to do with the, with the novel as well. Um, you know, you got layers of the detective stuff you got la- layers of cotton bell which will uh bring up slavery in your mind and the whole drugs thing 
And then so. al- also the great migration as well. Yeah. Because a lot of us have that are up in New York now have Southern roots. Mm-hmm. So earlier uh, you had this lady who wanted, who wants to dance, uh, but she just feels that, you know, the, the dance that she's doing is not really towards her, her, her peoples. Yeah. She's, she's a burlesque dancer. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, oddly enough, we mentioned Umar Johnson, shout out to Umar Johnson, but <laughs> she's, she's a conscious burlesque mm. dancer. And um, we know that Umar Johnson had a uh, had a had a tryst with a, a a lady named the Conscious Stripper. So I just yeah. kind of yeah, well. kind of made me think of that. But uh, she wants uh, more consciousness in her her performance. Hmm. And I didn't read the novel, but how does this particular you know? There's a scene coming up where she dances. You know, it starts off looking at some. Uh, uh, old to the to slavery and and coming up out of it, but then it changes to something. But how does that play? I'm, into I mean, the really, because there was so much to the novel here. The I, I guess the thing to remember here is like this uh, in the book, because mm-hmm. Chester Himes is 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 very ahead of his time. He pushes the envelope with issues, mm-hmm. so she's she's a full like where whereas she's burlesque here, mm-hmm. she's like a whole stripper there, <laughs> all right. Um, I don't know why she wanted the cotton there. I don't. I, I don't. I don't yeah. remember that. Yeah, it just went uh, from a theme from slavery to stripper. But like for her, 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 she's actually LGBT. She's actually a lesbian in the novel. Oh, okay. And she's kind of attracted to Iris. Hmm. So there's a part in the scene where Iris is is looking to change clothes or whatever, yeah, you know. and she go she goes to her that's that's where she's significant hmm. you know but here i see turns this this into some type of uh consciousness here so it's a very interesting For a moment twist uh yeah. on on the storyline here all right and even so as she she changes from dancing out of slavery into stripper mode you can also sense the people you know, they start to <laughs> celebrate it and in a sense get more into it, you know, because that's what she feels that she wants to do her thing. Got that Cardi B with consciousness. <laughs> oh, we gonna make him disappear. Know that we don't need him to remind us the bad old days are far behind the sound. That's where it all like cotton was the man. Oh, if cotton come to holler, think I boot cotton's butt. I boot his butt. Uncle Bud has been hustling this bale of cotton. That's how it falls into her hands in the first place. So Uncle Bud has sold it um, to the Jewish junk man um, for $25. Then he buys it back. Then he, then he resells it. So that's how she got to, to, to the bale of cotton. So Uncle Bud has been doing this. And in the, in the, in the midst of this, Uncle Bud turns up missing <laughs> you know his body turns up missing yeah so they think that he's uh he's been killed mm-hmm. and all along mind you they still trying to find that eighty-seven thousand that was taken by the people which they think is in the bale of cotton mm-hmm. or still in the bale of cotton like we mentioned like if you saw you know which is more recent den of thieves how it ends is very unique so like like the cars mentioned 
Uncle Bud is not around. Yeah. He's missing. And so is that 87,000, which was supposed to be in the bell of cotton. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and and Grave Digger and uh, Coffin Ed, for all their, you know, because they're not the most straight and narrow cops. <laughs> they really aren't. They, they, they do a little bit of brutality. Um, if, if, if push comes to shove, they need to take a bribe, they will do that. Yeah. But all in all, they care about their community. So they're trying to reunite this $87,000 uh-huh. with these families who have paid out this money in support of this fraudulent, you know, Garveyite type of <laughs> what they don't count on is that, uh, uncle Bud is, uh, smarter than everybody in the movie. Yeah. You know, and, uh. Uncle Bud actually makes off. Mm. He pulls a Bernie Madoff. And, yeah. And, you know, and, and apropos, Bernie made off with a lot of people's money. Mm-hmm. And so that's Uncle Bud right there. Yeah, he ends up somewhere <laughs> else around a bunch of women with the money. Dear Grave Digger Jones and Coffin Ed Johnson. If you are still dragging the river looking for the body of old Uncle Bud and the 87,000, stop. I am now a retired gentleman raising cotton on my villa in Africa. If you are ever in this neck of the woods, please drop in and see me. Yours truly, Bucker Washington Sims. <laughs> Better known as Old Uncle Buck. This was actually a, a, a fun type of movie if you into this kind of detective comedy, 70s Harlem, Ossie Davis type jump off. And, wow. and Deke actually gets exposed because if you notice, uh, Coffin Ed really has an issue. Yeah, yeah. With Reverend O'Malley, he's able to, you know, kind of beat him down, touch him up. Yeah, he, he, and exposes him in front of Mike Tyson, and Mitch Green type. The, type. the, <laughs> the whole community. Yeah. And so, um, whereas in the book, Deke O'Malley actually loses his life. Uh. But uh, for for a comedic purpose, and they actually have him shamed. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Deke actually says. Why don't you take it easy, man? Cool it. What's the matter with you? The black people been exploded by white people. Felt like you come along. Skin them some more. Judgment, Deke. Judgment. All right, man. All right. You, you keep the whole thing. I'll walk out of here, and I promise you, I'll never show my face in Harlem again as long as I live. Well? That's what you want, ain't it? No. I want you. Ed! Ed, listen! For God's sake, give me a chance! I could be another... another Garvey man, another Malcolm! There were some stand-up people at that time. Like, they stood for what our people should be doing it you know really cutting the ties and we were even defensive you know with the dope and stuff like that coming into our, the neighborhoods and stuff like that so even though they were rough around the edges as being cops but yeah. you know they were standing for something you know in a sense and you know didn't like what deke was thought he was standing for or yeah. portraying what he was standing for uh this was a very very good movie i liked the movie you know fan of Ossie Davis and his works yeah. um, and yeah. Raymond St. John. This was actually well received. I mean, the critics, again, uh-huh. they slammed it. Um, well, not slammed it, um, but, you know, they, you know, $1.2 million budget, uh-huh. it grosses $5.2 million. So uh-huh. that's really good. That's yeah. a, it's really good. It, it seems, you know, a lot of times you get movies that, you know, the reviews would be bad, but they end up being great movies, even up to this day. Um, it it just got to marinate with you. That's the yeah. that's the thing. Let it marinate, like, you know, and then you'll get it. A lot of times you don't get it until later. I like the fact that it's in Harlem, mm-hmm. which was really, really the epicenter of black culture. Yeah. And so, like, when you talk about famous neighborhoods, black neighborhoods, you, your mind goes to Harlem. Mm-hmm. Not so much anymore right. because of how gentrified it is. Mm-hmm. It's really Harlem Heights now. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, you know, there's still vestiges of 
uh, of Harlem, mm-hmm. especially when you get to those booths in 125th Street, you know, Lenox Avenue, the names are, are there mm-hmm. commem- commemorating the culture. So I like that it's in Harlem. Yeah. I like that. And not shot on the set. It was actually yeah. shot, shot on location, you know, with real people in the background. It was dope. And you got the real looks, real feel. Uh, but yeah, this is the first out of the set. After that comes Come Comeback Charleston, Charleston Blue. With a different director at this, at that time. Yeah, different director. Yeah. Same no, same novelist, though, yeah. uh, Chester Himes, but it's uh, based off of The Heat's On. And this this that movie that's coming up is going to take a totally different turn than the novel. Yep, and we'll be talking about that next week. All right, so and we this that's the wrap up for this movie. Cotton Comes to Harlem, 1970. Ossie Davis, the director, starring Godfrey Cambridge and Raymond St. Jock, uh, along with some others, Calvin Lockhart, Red Fox. And also, we ain't talk about, you know, Cleveland Little. Cleveland Little was Cleveland in this Little. movie. Yeah, Up and coming. He had a small con artist role, but yeah. But he's definitely a, uh, definitely a dynamic uh, actor as well. Yeah. Blazing um, Saddles would be his big, yeah, that big great. All right, so make sure y'all follow us on Facebook. Let us know how you felt about us, felt about this movie. Follow us on Instagram. Make sure you comment. Subscribe to our YouTube and check us out on Vimeo. And make sure y'all subscribe to us on our website. I am Sean Strong. And I am Dakaris McLaren. And we out for this episode. Peace. Right on. The Groove Pavement. Podcast, talk show, and movie review. Where we break down the black exploitation era, the cinematic genre, the exploitation of the black culture, and experience through film and media. We'll also dive into the cast, the subgenres, the TV shows, and the music. Outside of the films, we'll view some critical signs of the time and what these stories meant then and now, from entertainment to society to economics. The Groove Pavement. Can you dig it, sweet mama? I can dig it.